What? Good evening and welcome everyone to our session on monitoring unfreedom taking action, which will focus on the perspective of journalists and human rights advocates on the phenomenon of digital authoritarianism, what it means in concrete terms, how we can get a grip on the problem and most importantly, what we can do about it. Uh, my name is Carsten von Nahm. I'm the Managing Director of DW Academy, the Center for Media Development, Journalism Training and Knowledge Transfer of Deutsche Welle, Germany's international public service broadcaster. So let me introduce our panelists today. First of all, a warm welcome to Nanjala Nyabola, an award-winning journalist from Kenya. She's a director of the AdVox Project of Global Voices an international community of writers, bloggers, and digital activists dedicated to the dialogue of citizens' voices across borders and cultures. And she's heading the Unfreedom Monitor project, of which we'll hear a bit in the context of this session. Also with us today is Laís Martins, a Brazilian journalist based in Sao Paulo. She's an expert on political communication and the intersection of politics, human rights, and information technology. And she contributed to the report on Brazil for the Unfreedom Monitor, which I just mentioned. Welcome also to you. Joining us uh, online from Thailand is Annie Zeman. She uh, has worked in the field of freedom of expression, the safety of journalists um, in two continents, five countries, and three languages. She managed teams and newsrooms in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Myanmar and most recently co-founded the Exile Hub to support Burmese media and critical voices in exile after the military coup in Myanmar. A warm welcome also to you, Annie. And last but not least, there's Vladimir Cortes, a photojournalist and digital rights program officer with Article 19 in Mexico. He focuses on human rights and the internet while monitoring online aggressions against journalists and others exercising their right to freedom of expression. Once again, thank you very much to all of you and also uh, to all of you in the audience for joining us. We will also try our best to open the discussion to you on the floor as quickly as possible. But first, to get a better idea of the issue of digital authoritarianism, what it means and most importantly, what to do about it, let's bring in our panelists. Nanjala, I'll start with you. Uh, digital authoritarianism is a catchy expression, uh, but what does it actually mean? How would you define the problem at hand? Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, microphone. Thank you, Carson. Um, I hope you will forgive me and allow me to stand. Um, I'd like to stand. Do we have slides? Just press it and they show it, but I don't think your microphone yeah. is working. This one's, yes, there we go. Um, so, as you heard, my name is Nanjala, and um, part of a team of about 14 or 17 people spread across 14 different countries around the world who have been working on the project that we call the Unfreedom Monitor. Our definition, our project basically looks at digital authoritarianism and the rise of digital authoritarianism across various types of governments around the world. Our definition of digital authoritarianism is very pared down to the brass tax, which is the use of technology to advance authoritarian ideals, to advance authoritarian practices in different countries around the world. And the reason why we defined it that way is because we wanted to look both at the contextual issues, that is thinking about how different choices made in the digital space can affect the ability, can, or rather can influence the rise of authoritarianism, but also the choice to go beyond that and use tech to advance offline or analog authoritarian practices. So we're tracking digital, the rise of digital authoritarianism um, around the world. Very uh, brief summary of the project. It's a global cross-cutting qualitative and quantitative research on the emergence and impact of digital authoritarianism in the public sphere. 
For this first round, we looked at 11 countries in different parts of completely disparate parts of the world, but we also had four researchers who were looking at thematic focuses, and we labeled them data, information, access, and speech. So we were looking at practices that govern both the creation and the dissemination of data. We're looking at the flow of information, following on the principle that information is a core pillar of democracy and open society. We're looking at access to the internet and how interference of, with access of the internet, to the internet, things like shutdowns, th bandwidth throttling, etc., are used to advance authoritarian ideals. And we were also looking at speech, and this really ties in very closely with the theme of this conference, how um, authoritarian regimes or governments that are trying to advance authoritarian goals control the freedom of expression, particularly online, in order to advance authoritarianism. Our final product for this first round is a large data set, data set of 400 items and counting, um, and 14 individual reports, as well as 30 pieces of journalism from all of these countries. And this is the a uh, briefing note or the main report which is available to download from our website. And these are the countries that we're looking at. As you can see, we really tried to go wide with the geographical scope um, and our researchers were looking at basically the through line that connects freedom of expression both in the analog and the digital space with the rise of digital authoritarianism. We've grouped all of our thematic work, um, as you can see, just for ease of analysis into internet controls, surveillance, information manipulation, technology controls, freedom restrictions, and system attacks. And there's various practices that are comprised of each of those titles. And these are the, the countries that you can see on the, on the right. I'm not gonna go into great detail about the report. I just wanted to share the three key conclusions. It was very deliberate choice to look at various styles of government. And if I can go back, I'll show you very quickly. As you can see, some of these countries you wouldn't ordinarily think of off the bat when you think about authoritarianism. And in our briefing note, we explain why in our methodology we had to open up, up a little bit. So much of our thinking of what is an authoritarian regime is loaded by normative considerations. We, want, we like these governments and we don't like those governments. And so we say these governments are authoritarian and those governments are not authoritarian. But the vast majority of people live in uh, in the world today live in countries that wouldn't neatly fall into either one of those categories. And yet these practices are spreading and yet it's a threat to their freedom and it's their, a threat to their rights. So you can see a lot of these countries wouldn't necessarily jump onto your mind when people talk about authoritarianism, but we've seen an alarming rise in authoritarian practices. And that's one of the key conclusions in our report. Don't be so hung up on the type of government, but open up the thinking to realize that all types of government are vulnerable to digital authoritarianism. And it's not necessarily a product of the type of government, even though some type of governments are more vulnerable than others. It's a product of political cultures of intolerance to criticism and to difference. Secondly, the key indicators that we wanted to underline in the report is that press freedom is a major predictor of the rise of digital authoritarianism. Journalists are canary in the coal mine. When the attacks happen and when they start happening, specifically female journalists are a particular um, indicator. There's like a, a predictive, it, it, it's a predictive quality that's embedded in that. It's almost like once you see that female journalists no longer feel safe to practice their, their craft, to be able to do their job safely, you start to see the emergence of these cultures, what we're calling cultures of intolerance, of cultures of criticism and difference. And finally, the thing that I would love to, we really wanted to underscore in this report is the role of private capital. It's so easy to get caught up on these two axes. What are the people doing and what, by three axes, let's say, what are the people doing? What is civic society doing? What is government doing? And so often the practices of private capital go completely ignored. And yet, Private capital is an enabling factor in all of this. And we find that technology that is developed, that is funded in one part of the world, quickly disseminates into different parts of the world if it's left unchecked. You're not going to be safe because it's happening in that geographic location and not this geographic location. One of the names that came up in, I would say, nine of the 11 country reports that we we, of the analysis that we did was Pegasus in the NSO group. And we didn't know this going into the report. This was something that emerged from the research that we were doing. And we would have our seminars sort of unpacking the research and certain names, certain companies, technology that is produced in countries that are nominally democratic um, 
in Italy, in Israel, going around the world and bringing out these authoritarian outcomes in these selected countries. So once certain types of technology take root in one part of the world, they will inevitably make their way world, worldwide. And so controlling the capacity of private capital to invest in the development of these technologies of a digital authoritarianism is a key part of controlling its spread. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nanjala. Um, now, we've seen what this um, Unfreedom Monitor is all about. Um, there are many indexes for freedom of the press and so on. So what, what makes this special? Is it the more in-depth analysis, or how would you describe the, the major benefit of what you've done? Well, I'm going to give you a very uh, nerdy answer, which is the methodology that we're using combines both qualitative and quantitative research, and um, the, we are bringing in this extra element of political um, analysis and contextualization that's really missing from some of these other um, reports. We're not ranking countries. We're not saying this country is more free than the other than the other country, and that was also a deliberate choice because what we're raising the alarm over is the fact that these are the contextual issues that enable digital authoritarianism to come down the pipeline. I think the other piece of, of uh, what we're doing that's super interesting is that we have created a through line that connects things that often, I think even this is the first time that UNESCO has centered the digital in thinking about what press freedom looks like and what press, fr press freedom is about. And that's something that we wanted to do with this report. We're drawing this line that connects what happens with journalism, what happens with media, to what happens in the digital space. I think for a long time when we were thinking about um, tech and the internet and digital, um, the, the digital space, we kind of thought about it as something separate. But in many countries around the world, the real value add of especially social media is that it performs roles that were traditionally performed by traditional media that has since retreated because of all of the crisis issues that we're talking about. Lack of funding, um, um, you know, journalists feeling not feeling safe, you know, newsrooms shrinking, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have countries whereby the first place that people go to to get political information, to participate in political discourse, to participate even in polling and, and all kinds of conversation is online. And yet in our analysis, we still for a long time were looking at the digital as kind of, there's like a wall between what was happening there and what was happening on the traditional media. But what we're really sh showing with our analysis is that there's a through line there. And you have to understand that um, if you don't address the issue at this particular point, there's something coming down the pipeline that's going to complicate your political context significantly. Thank you. Now let's have a look at what that means um, in, in concrete terms. Uh, Lies, you wrote the report um, on Brazil for the Unfreedom Monitor. And how far is digital authoritarianism a problem in Brazil? After all, it is still a democratic country. Yes, thank you, Carsten. Um, I think I'd like to uh, map out some areas to think about. There are definitely things in Brazil that merit our concern and attention at the moment, even though it's still a democracy in paper, at least. Um, so, yeah, if you could skip. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk, talk about is, so I'll be focusing on the Bolsonaro government because it's impossible to not to talk about him. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is how his government and himself have adopted social media as a key strategy ever since the beginning of um, his campaign, actually. Um, so I think we should acknowledge how important social media is for Bolsonaro, um, especially in how he communicates with his supporter base. So one key development I single out in my um, report that might seem very trivial is the fact that Bolsonaro uses weekly live transmissions to talk to his supporter base. Uh, and they are very, uh, it's a deliberate choice of holding these live transmissions in a time where it happens right before the main news program in the country. It happens when journalists, uh, when uh, the biggest newspapers are closing off their print editions. So either coverage is left out or it goes in unchecked or with very little context. So he ultimately achieves his objective of having this unmediated and unche unchecked um, dialogue with his supporter base. Uh, they are watched by millions of supporters on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and now they've been taking to other less traditional platforms. 
Um, I think when talking about social media, it's also very important to um, mark that the government in Brazil has been tied to influence campaigns. So supposedly, according to police investigations that are still ongoing, there is a, a hate cabinet, that's what it's called, operating from within the presidential palace. So these are presidential aides responsible for smear campaigns, disinformation and misinformation campaigns, many of which target journalists. Finally, I think when I write mutual crackdowns, it's because we must acknowledge that this relationship between Bolsonaro and the platforms is one ridden with tension, as was in the United States with President Trump. Um, I, I think there's a very clear mark of when this relationship started souring in March 2020 amid the pandemic, when the platforms start to moderate Bolsonaro for his um, negationist, denialist stance on the pandemic. And he starts to build a slow but steady response that comes very markedly in September 2021 in the form of a provisional uh, decree, a provisional measure, which we must say is a very unilateral, opaque and authoritarian instrument to be used in Brazil. And with this uh, provisional measure, he tries to overturn the way platforms operate in Brazil to fit within conditions that are pre-established by the government. And with that, he tries to emphasize moderation, to focus on speech and content, which we know by now is not desirable. The second development is citizen data. I think this came very strongly in my research for uh, the Unfreedom Monitor, which is an uh, attempt to unify and merge government databases, sharing them between many, many agencies Inve uh, uh, intelligence agencies, police agencies, and this is happening on the federal, but also on the state levels. Um, these proposals pose heightened risks to citizen privacy because they happen in a context where the uh, consent, the finality, and uh, the sharing of this data is not clearly established, the criteria are not clear cl clearly established, and it runs counter to Brazilian legislation on the topic. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, in the context of this government and probably future governments, we must pay attention that this, use, this data might be used for authoritarian purposes, for political persecution, uh, for citizen surveillance, as well as the possibility that this data eventually makes its way to the private sector. We have an example of Brazil of something that might happen soon in this sense, so I think there is ground for concern. And finally, the last development I'd like to talk about is press freedom, which is the reason why we are all here. And I think these uh, two developments I mentioned earlier also constrain and impact the professional work of journalists and their integrity. When I mention um, the weekly live transmissions, for example, that makes journalists' jobs harder in Brazil. And that deteriorates the quality of information reaching audiences. Um, but in addition to these developments, uh, it's important to mark, and I say this without any concern, that Bolsonaro and uh, many of his allies and elected officials have been openly attacking journalists in Brazil. And the fact that this comes from elected officials, from people who are protected by their roles, this encourages and legitimates attacks by civilians. So we are seeing a growth in attacks uh, just regular attacks against journalists online and offline by citizens who feel encouraged to do so. And it's very important that we look uh, at these attacks through a gender lens. Um, in Brazil, women journalists, and I put some data in here, uh, are much more targeted than men by attacks, both online and what offline. Is, what is the reason for that? Well, then we have to go into a very uh, deep <laughs> explanation. Um, I think I, I would say uh, they are more exposed in the sense that we have many prominent journalists in Brazil and I could always bring up the example of Patricia Campos Melo, which I mentioned in my report. Uh, it's probably the biggest um, gender-based attack against a journalist we have seen in Brazil and it came from the president's son and the, son himself, and the president himself in which they accused her of exchanging her body for sexual, for a scoop. Uh, and the word... Uh, and. Yeah, I'm not going to repeat it, but it's, it was a very ugly way in which they accused her. She broke a big story right before the 2018 uh, second round elections. And eventually, her source made it to a Senate hearing. And during the hearing, this source uh, alleged that she had exchanged her body for uh, sexual favors for the scoop. And this claim was reproduced by 
federal deputy Eduardo Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's son, and later Bolsonaro made a joke out of it. So I think when the biggest leader in the country or the highest figure does that, other people, everyone below them think it's okay to attack yeah. a woman for that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that men are not attacked, it's just that the attacks against women are much more pervasive and violent, and they last longer. So it's not one day, it's not a precise attack, it keeps on building and it comes up in groups, it comes up in waves. And there are marked figures in Brazil who are always the attack journalists. So I think we, ha we cannot forget the gender lens. It's very important that we monitor. As Nanjala said, uh, when women journalists start getting attacked, it's, it's a sign of big concern. Yes. So and I think that's it on my part. Well, Obviously, we could talk about all these yeah. issues for a long time, but let's try to, to um, wrap it up and also look at some, some other regions. Let's um, turn to Annie in Thailand now. Um, Annie, you have been following the situation in Myanmar very closely. Now, that's not just an authoritarian regime. That's um, a full-blown military dictatorship. Um, when the military took over in Myanmar, what were the repercussions online um, in the digital sphere and how have those events in turn influenced the situation on the ground? Uh, thank you. So uh, creeping uh, digital authoritarianism has been a part of the strategy of Myanmar's uh, journals from the beginning, since the coup, you know, be it uh, planned shutdowns of mobile internet access uh, or be it the blockage of social media and the use of regime propaganda to blunt criticism. And uh, while we see that it's not uncommon in Thailand, and I'm getting back to what uh, uh, Nigella and uh, Unfreedom Monitor, they mentioned that usually we come to think that it's only happening in uh, 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 military dictatorships, but we have seen that this has been taken or many surveillance or authoritarianism under digital sphere has been done uh, or pro uh, earlier, like during the, uh, the uh, democratic government as well. But after the uh, coup, things got very blatant and they have they are left with no shame or no, uh, 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 they're not even pretending now that, okay, that Myanmar has uh, been using surveillance technology uh, for its citizen under the name of, you know, uh, opening up in the last, you know, before uh, before the coup. But coming to the coup on 1st of uh, Feb 2020, we saw that the country has been pushed back 10 years back, you know. They're trying to look at more towards China model, trying to build more a wall and more structures uh, within their digital spheres where the citizens are not allowed to look outward or to get any information from outside. Uh, for example, like, you know, we have seen earlier the longest uh, uh, internet shutdowns in Myanmar before the coup in Rakhine and the Chin state. But after that, we have seen that they have gone, um, the military has uh, articulated and become so sophisticated in uh, their digital tools. And uh, they are like uh, reports and verified reports that they are getting like trainings from Russia. They're getting, you know, more uh, and more support uh, from China. How to be more uh, like uh, uh, exactly, you know, uh, uh, it's Myanmar is a case study, I would say, when it comes to digital authoritarianism. All the uh, marks, you know, if someone would ever do any kind of index, it comes like, you know, that, okay, internet uh, uh, shutdown, yes. Uh, targeted internet shutdown, yes. Uh, VPNs blocked, yes. Legal, for example, in Myanmar, journalists coming to like journalists and uh, critical voices in the digital sphere or uh, uh, offline and online both. We see Myanmar uh, now, the military uh, junta is using a law, for example, uh, 505A, and there are more than 120 journalists uh, in the last 15 months who have been arrested, and most of them are facing 505A, which means any kind of, you know, a defamation or bringing fear or anything, you know, they would, uh, uh, be, uh, anyway, they don't need anything. It's military. It's uh, uh, They can just come and pick you up. But what we see now, uh, uh, the slide has shown that MRTV in Myanmar or uh, Mayawadi, which is state-run propaganda channels, in the last, like, 15 months, what the uh, military has done is they have revoked licenses of 12 uh, media houses. Uh, but uh, what we see on the other hand is they're still present. 
the whole media has le- like they are operating from outside they're working from exile and within myanmar it's very difficult to um, manage but why this picture i'm showing is it's early days of uh, 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 the coup and people could still come out on the streets and what we haven't done in the last 5 year bef- uh, on the transition to democracy about media literacy or telling citizens that okay this is a propaganda channel and this is independent channel after coup what i feel is that it has changed tremendously who has actually brought that kind of awareness uh, among civil society and in every corner in Myanmar that this is the state media and this is a propaganda like fake news mrtv you know it's toxic people came out i have not seen it this kind of uh, you know understanding uh, the, then we have also uh, see in Myanmar is that uh, sudden emergence of um, underground media uh, when the bigger big medias were all banned they could not come they could not publish or everyone went underground then we saw like young people coming out and even printing like these kind of small a4 size tab- tabloid size different kind of you know in their own communities they started you know sharing information then we also see like earlier the myanmar media was very much focused in, uh, in yangon city rangon but after the coup and even now uh, like in uh, people we still see new emerging underground media small ethnic media which has come out very resilient and they are still reporting what media was pushed 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 but still like they are operating some of them are still in uh, in the country where there are like so many shutdowns it's difficult to operate there's no internet there's no electricity and what the gov- uh, military junta has recently done is that they have increased the uh, that you cannot access to get any activate any kind of uh, internet access for example the sim cards if you want uh, to buy a sim card in myanmar earlier you didn't have to register yourself but now if you are re- you a you have to register yourself b you have to pay 200000 myanmar chart to activate your sim card so it's, it's it's like shrinking and shrinking that availability of you know to go online has become very difficult in myanmar right now still uh, coming back to it that this is a uh, myanmar civil society is very resilient myanmar uh, uh, journalist community or media is like they're so resilient that i have not seen under this kind of crackdown uh, three of our colleagues have been brutally killed by the military junta and uh, uh, 12 media licenses revoked uh, like 48 journalists are still behind bars 13 of them are women journalists still people believe in the power of digital media and the power of democracy they want it back and what uh, this picture on the screen shows is uh, taken in the early days of uh, Uh, the coup and civil disobedience movement in myanmar that everything people felt like Myan- in myanmar facebook was the internet and everything uh, after the coup was uh, uh, like it was not televised it was facebook lived we have seen our colleagues for example when the military was coming to get them from their homes they were they went facebook uh, live because that was the only tool for them to show the world what's happening to them and that is why the military blocked facebook instagram twitter and now like everyone in myanmar was using uh, vpns and now they have even uh, penalized vpns in myanmar and the problem of course is that these governments or other players can actually learn and i'm bringing up here this graphics courtesy uh, of freedom house about you know the different dimensions of how china uh, does this kind of a textbook example of digital authoritarianism and we can see it's not just a famous great firewall it's a mix of restricting access that you just mentioned any technical attacks it's also surveillance it's about physical violence imprisoning critics um do you see this as a kind of a blueprint for authoritarian regimes or other political players who want to go into that direction what china is doing for instance yes i feel that this um, thanks to freedom house they have very nicely placed things which i mentioned and we see that 
somehow there is a fascination in Southeast Asia to look towards China when it comes to digital authoritarianism. And when we see and try to advocate or lobby uh, with the uh, uh, different policymakers in Southeast Asia that what's happening, uh, it's always like, okay, uh, surveillance and technology comes as uh, that, okay, it's for uh, the benefit of uh, the citizens. For example, in Myanmar, the surveillance for uh, uh, traffic police or, for example, uh, all the cameras right now in Nepido and uh, Yangon were installed earlier to uh, uh, give support to the people. But how it's used is a big question mark. And uh, it's not just, I would say, uh, Everyone's like, you know, Mecca or like uh, they want to look forward to China, everything. It's it's actually, you are right, it's a digital blueprint. And Myanmar uh, is looking, uh, Myanmar had like eight friends, you know, only eight countries which are publicly supporting Myanmar. And two of them are like, sadly, you know, uh, 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 it's it's Russia and China, which so one could clearly see where they are heading towards. Uh, yeah, um, I would like to use the um, the moment to also once again um, ask uh, everyone or invite everyone to uh, contribute and ask questions. We'll come to you in about uh, three to five minutes. Uh, but first of all, thank you, Annie, uh, for this, and I would like to. Uh, come to uh, Vladimir, and um, we've heard from Najala that um, it's not just governments; it's also, you know, private groups or, or uh, business interests that are dangerous. I mean, your country, Mexico, knows a bit about that. Everybody knows that journalism is a very dangerous job in in Mexico. Uh, people are killed not so much by the government, but basically by criminals or or business tycoons or other uh, people. Now. How does it look like in the digital sphere when it comes to that? And what role does the government play there to protect journalists or maybe also to hunt down journalists? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks also to the Dutch Valley Academy and Carson for uh, the question and sharing this amazing panel with different contexts, but at the same time uh, a line around how digital authoritarianism is uh, taking place uh, in some cases like really extremely and, and how it criminalizes uh, the exercise of rights and, and, and the voices and how it's silencing different uh, countries all over the world. And yes, uh, Mexico has a very particular context. Uh, we just registered around 644 attacks towards the uh, media and journalists in 2021, eight journalists uh, being killed uh, just the first uh, months of 2022, which is like really sad and, and, and terrible and how uh, there is like uh, this uh, vacuum of, of, of state and, and, and protection of, uh, of, of journalists. And uh, just to say in 2021, each 14 hours a journalist is uh, attacked or has been attacked uh, in, in Mexico. And the main responsible and the main perpetrator of this uh, violence is still the Mexican government and Mexico uh, state and, and, and different authorities. In this context of uh, violence uh, and stigmatization also towards uh, media, journalists and those who dissent, and I think that's like a particularly way to connect on what uh, Njala was like mentioning on this culture of intolerance to criticism and difference. That's how the reaction towards digital authoritarianism uh, begins with first, ignore, uh, there is like an ignorance of the digital ecosystem. It's just like a, a not knowing exactly what they really want to regulate. And it's just like the idea of let's uh, regulate the digital sphere and let's start uh, drafting this uh, old type of, of bills, which ends up in something that I uh, really uh, believe in, and, and the lack uh, also of uh, the importance of recognizing that we have the same rights in the online and the offline sphere. That's something that uh, sometimes the states uh, forgot. And what we are seeing is the vocation of control. It's how we establish now certain regulation and certain uh, norms and, and ways to control 
the internet or trying to control the internet because that's the space in which now we're seeing the protests, we're seeing the debates, we're seeing the criticism, we're seeing the dissent. So in that uh, moment we are seeing this uh, promotion of uh, and, and restrictions that stifle human rights, uh, not establishing safeguards towards the government, uh, also sometimes allowing or making the opening the door for uh, companies also to uh, remove certain contents and uh, establish a certain uh, very broad concept to uh, basically prosecute all those who are dissenting and who are like uh, criticizing. And, uh, and, and very particularly also on uh, making a pressure to narrow digital space. What we were uh, seeing in 2020 it's more than 15 uh, bills uh, around uh, cybersecurity, disinformation, uh, what uh, has been called as uh, wrongly the right to be forgotten. So different bill, uh, bills in which they are uh, trying to establish a more uh, control over the uh, digital sphere and the digital realm. And just recently, we have a, uh, a, a very strong uh, battle uh, with the creation or the Mexican government want to create. And when I was like listening to Anya on what's happening in Myanmar, the government proposed uh, the creation of the National Registry to Mobile Telephone Users. A way not just like to conditioning the access to technology and the internet. It's like, yes, there are many countries that uh, uh, require uh, SIM registration. The thing is that the government wanted to acquire and uh, obligate to the users to collect biometric data. So putting it in danger uh, and in, in this centralized uh, database, because the argument was like, we want to uh, fight extortion, we want to fight uh, uh, for uh, organized crime and so on. So they took place this and they implemented this uh, really authoritarian uh, way of uh, accessing uh, technology and, and, and mobile registration uh, SIM cards as it's happening in countries like Saudi Arabia, China, Pakistan, uh, of collecting uh, in a disproportionate way, in an unjustified uh, way, and interfering basically with private uh, rights by collecting this uh, biometric data. And just like to remember, biometric data, it's not just like a password in which if something happens, you just like change and, uh, and then uh, nothing happens. In, in the case of biometric data, your fingerprints, iris, and so on, there is something that really affects uh, your, whole, uh, your whole life. So those are some of the uh, things that we are seeing from uh, the Congress, from the attacks uh, by, the, by the president, and this idea of uh, having more control of the digital ecosystem and those who are using internet and using uh, the digital sphere to descend to propagate uh, their journalistic uh, pieces uh, and uh, also that will affect the access to information of uh, uh, information of public interest. And, and that problem is there not just in dictatorships, it's also there in, in democratic countries, which might be on a path to a more authoritarian style, style of government, is basically what you all have been saying. Now, I would like to um, open the floor to some questions, if there are any, before... We also want to talk about, so what do we do with this? I mean, that's the important question here also. You know, what, what can we do to address the situation, to improve it? But first of all, I would like to give you, in the audience, uh, the chance to ask questions, if there are any. There is one in the back, and I'm afraid I have to bring this microphone personally to you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maya. I'm from Brazil. I'm uh, executive director of the journalism, Digital Journalism Association. We've been recently founded. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Laís about specifically, I mean, we're going through a specific period in Brazil that's very uh, serious and intense, and we've been, we have growing concerns about uh, the elections this year. And I wanted to hear you. I, I saw that you've 
presented several categories that you researched about, and Brazil had, about, I, thought, well, I think, three of them. And I wanted to understand how uh, maybe all of you guys, not only Laís, um, see that uh, things could become um, uh, graver, worse, and how this type of problems uh, intensify and what are the path that we could see, uh, because as an association we're worried that we want to guarantee the organizations, the media organizations, some type of support and, and protection and their employees, of course, and we wanted to be able to, um, I don't know, look forward and already have a project in mind to help them in this period. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maya. And by the way, happy birthday to Ajar, which is one year old today and doing important work in Brazil. So we know each other. <laughs> yeah, and I know Ajar. Um, so I think, I think this is an exercise we have to do. What if it gets worse, right? Because many signs are there that it might get worse until the end of the year. So one thing uh, as a practicing journalist that I think about is that we need to speak more in Brazil about digital safety and offline safety of journalists. I think we let it get to a very serious point that now we have begun discussing strategies for journalists to protect themselves on the ground and online. And only when things happen, they seek uh, assistance from the newsroom uh, and it might be too late. So I think that's one thing we have to look at. And then one thing that me and my imagination exercise when I think of worst case scenarios, I think one big challenge that we have to prepare ourselves, and luckily we have examples of what not to do from the US, is what happens if the president, the current president, contests election results. How will we cover that? How will we cover offline violence in that case? So I think we have time to our advantage, right? We are months before election, months before uh, the new president, the incoming president, or this one takes office again. So I think these are discussions we as newsrooms and you on your side as journalism associations should start thinking. I think it's time to plan out, to prepare, to really sit down together and just think like, how will we cover this? Well, maybe the big, big newsrooms are doing that and I'm not aware, I hope they are. But I think that's a discussion that we need to start having. And it has to go through journalist safety. Yeah. And Jana, um, to you know, look at the, the world as a whole, I mean, in your report, you've covered these different areas. What would you like to, to add there? What, what, what could be other measures to, do, to, to deal with situations like that? I mean, Brazil is a special case, but there are others like it. I think it's super interesting because um, in my own country in Kenya, we have an election coming up this year and we're asking the same questions. And I think there's, there's two different places, uh, three different places of action that I would want people to pay attention to. One is, of course, the individual responsibility that journalists have to each other, to themselves, to the professional networks and things like that. And it's very useful to have, in if you live in an earthquake zone or if you live in a, a hurricane zone, they always tell you to have a grab bag packed. So it's a bag that has like money and it has like a change of clothes and, an, and emergency things, you know, in case uh, the hurricane hits and you need to get out of your house very quickly. I think it's important for journalists who are working online to think in that sense, sort of in a metaphorical sense. I say this because in a lot of the reports that we had, we've had internet shutdowns, and social media throttling, um, social media shutdowns, and we have incre it's increasingly common for governments that are frustrated with certain types of government with certain types of coverage to simply switch off the internet. And if you're a digital journalist where you're dependent on the internet to reach your audiences, to amplify what you're writing about, to connect to be to be safe, to connect with people who make you feel safe, you need to have a set of toolkits that's like a grab bag that allows you to still remain in contact with people in case you get switched off. The re writing that we have on Sudan is an excellent example of how digital journalists can coordinate to circumvent some, and Myanmar as well actually, because we do have a researcher in Myanmar, how people, citizen journalists, professional journalists, digital journalists can coordinate these 
toolkits, these basic grab bag things, whether you're thinking about VPNs, you're thinking about uh, SIM cards that are registered. One of my favorite tactics has been people doing a relay system with SIM cards that are registered in the country across the border, which allows you to be able to send messages, to tweet messages online when your own country gets uh, knocked offline. And the thing is, if you think about organizations like Article 19, um, CPJ, people have been thinking about this, and we think about this at Advox and Global Voices. So as a starting point for thinking about putting together your digital grab bag to reach out to organizations that have been working on digital safety and digital rights and find out what are the best practices that have been put in place in other contexts where journalists have had to come, uh, have to come up on, on these challenges. Um, in terms of structural issues, I think that it's really great. We've had some really good declarations at this conference, and I think there's momentum at the multilateral level to think about uh, data governance and internet governance not as a national challenge, but as a transnational challenge. And I think it's important to double down on those specific strategies. We really emphasize the role of private capital because we see how it's such a blind spot for thinking about what the future of internet is going to be like, that we assumed for a long time because the private companies told us, first, do no harm, we're going to move fast and break things, etc. We trusted them. And we said, sure, the internet is great. Do whatever you want. It's not that important. People are just posting pictures of their food. And the reality is not that. We are living in an era of datification, that we're being turned into data points. Our private information is being turned into data points and then being commercialized. And I think there's finally a growing awareness that there's a room for multilateral action. In this particular case, as I said, one of the things that was really astounding for us when we were talking to each other in our seminars was someone would say something about Pegasus and, and then we'll say, oh, they bought that in Zimbabwe. Oh, they bought that in Tanzania. Oh, yeah, we have that in Mexico. We have that in, in Brazil. Or um, what was the Italian one? Hacking. Hacking team. Oh, yeah, we have that in Ecuador. They did that in, and this through line, and yet Hacking team is an Italian company. When we think digital authoritarianism, nobody goes, oh yeah, Italy, yeah, sure. You know, when we think digital authoritarianism, not everyone does, but some people do, thinks, oh my gosh, Israel, you know, that is, <laughs> that is a place where, and yet, the most sophisticated technology that's being used to enable is not being built by the countries that are buying them. It's being built by companies and being exported um, under the guise of, we're only working with, com with countries that we agree with. And so we're really, it's really important for us to understand the transnational nature of digital authoritarianism and specifically the role of private capital and profit-making corporations because this technology is not being given away for free. It's not, and, 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 and again, to think beyond good country, bad country and really look at it nationally because as I say this, I'm not absolving, for example, China from the sale of surveillance technology to Zimbabwe and the sale of surveillance technology to the Sudanese junta. All of this is part of the story. Let's have a more complete um, conversation about the transnational nature of this and think about it from a governance perspective. I think uh, Michelle Bachelet in her recorded remarks made a really important observation. We have to put a pause on surveillance tech right now because it's already completely out of control and it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other questions? Oh, we fixed the internet. <gasps> <laughs> Sure. Yeah, sure. Please add. Thank you. I think what Nanjala is mentioning, just to have a perspective on how digital authoritarianism is related to a greater business and uh, how it links to China. We are seeing now in Mexico the selling of uh, surveillance cameras with artificial intelligence, uh, biometric recognition, face recognition by Dawa company, just like first coming and saying, oh, we have like this gr super great technology. Uh, and our government is like, yes, this idea of like uh, techno solutionism and techno optimism that yes, if we are having more cameras with uh, face recognition, then we are going to fight against uh, security. But how Francisco Partners, uh, who at, at some point owned uh, NSO Group and uh, by selling the uh, Pegasus uh, spyware throughout the world, first they acquired NSO Group for like around $200 million. After like uh, seven, eight years, they sell it for like $1 billion. So it's 
during that amount of uh, that period of time, there are like many governments, and still we saw it uh, recently in El Salvador, uh, how governments, even though with all the stories and all the uh, aggressions that were journalists using uh, the spy group Pegasus, they are like creating this, uh, they are acquiring this this type of technology, and. Just to say about the responses from what we have seen in, in Mexico. First, the idea of creating democratic controls, and I think the moratorium also to this type of technology is really important. But also, how do we build these robust uh, systems and, and legal frameworks to really uh, uh, not uh, uh, being abused by authorities and targeting activists and journalists by this type of, of technologies. Now we saw with this uh, mobile registration SIM card in Mexico that the judiciary power, it's also, it's still in some countries uh, where independent uh, judiciary bodies are and on how they are defying, how they're protecting constitutional uh, rights. I think that was something important made by uh, civil society. Networking also and create these alliances, Article 19, with uh, the network of uh, the defense of digital rights, R3D, and some other organizations. We unite and we start defying this. And the, oh, the last ones, it's campaigning and connecting with people connecting with those to raise awareness on how this type of digital authoritarianism practices, even in democratic societies, are affecting, and we have to be aware, and we have like to react in, 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 a, in a period of time to stop this type of uh, actions. So one conclusion I think already we can, we can say from, from this is that raising awareness is, is one of the most important tools in, in fighting digital authoritarianism, because this for all the problems that we've seen which, uh, with, with the, um, you know, the digital sphere, uh, there's still this optimism that digital revolution will you know, give us more freedom, more access, but in fact it's also a tool for more unfreedom, basically. So that is, I think, uh, one important thing, and, and, and many of, of the organizations that are present here at this conference, of course, support it. But what else could be... Um, could be ways to address this. And maybe there's, any coming back to you, maybe there's also from, from the region where you are, there are some experiences. You mentioned that there's a very resilient civil society in Myanmar, but also if you look at other countries in your region. Is there something the rest of the world can learn from the experience in your area? Um. Uh, thank you, Karsten. Uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, other uh, panelists have said about um, awareness. Uh, that's a starting point for sure. And what we see in Myanmar is like over like one day, like on 31st Jan, uh, it was very difficult to convince someone that these particular channels are only reporting pro-military or pro-government uh, 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 narrative. Fast forward 24 hours later, we see suddenly like the whole country has become expert on media literacy, which like so many media development organization or media itself could not do in the opening of five years in Myanmar. Uh, but awareness uh, is not the only thing which we need uh, to be resilient. We need emergency assistance, uh, some kind of set uh, networks, which I think in Myanmar, for example, uh, I would like to mention here, there's a coalition of journalists in distress that has been so supportive to us. If uh, there's one uh, picture which I uh, uh, shared in, our, um, in my screen uh, earlier, uh, it's about a box, you know, we used to receive care packages even Everything was closed, borders were closed down in Myanmar, but we still had a community, we still have. And at that time, that community, those uh, our networks uh, were so strong in the neighboring countries that they were able to send us SIM cards of like hundreds and thousands already topped up. And if you remember, we had like constant, you know, uh, blockade of internet from 12 to 9 a.m., which became a part of the life. But on that time, journalists had to report or people had to share with each other where the raids are happening, where they have to, you know, run away from. And at that time, that support, little support of a $10 SIM and then top ups from around the world, from unions, uh, uh, even from Brazil, we got like, you know, support from uh, 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 Brazilian uh, Union of journalists, that little support really matters. So I would really say that awareness is important, but then our networks and how we need to be secure that what if, as uh, uh, Najila said, an earthquake comes, 
Do we need? Do we know where we are going to run? Which are our safety points? Uh, those countries who already see like these things happening, be it uh, uh, Brazil, be it Mexico, be it India, be it Pakistan, where the governments are like uh, on the face of it, they are uh, uh, democracies, uh, but they are hybrid regimes. There are militaries behind this who want to control citizens and don't want civil societies to have any kind of space to know what's happening around them. And uh, what we have learned from the uh, Myanmar journalists who are so, again, you know, resilient uh, is the word for that, that it's not the first time they are seeing the crackdown. They ha have seen it in 1988 and they know how to operate in exile. That's also very important for uh, uh, journalists or civil society to know that once our own governments, our own country is not giving us space, then how, where we are going to go. And this is very much, uh, I think, uh, a positive, uh, a little bit of, you know, of uh, the internet and digital sphere where we live in, that we can still operate. Where even when in our own countries, I, for example, I cannot uh, live and work from Myanmar, like the hundreds and thousands of other of my colleagues, but we could still participate in the discussion and the narrative and keep on bringing to the world that what's happening in Myanmar. So I think digital uh, awareness and digital like community uh, is very important uh, to stay resilient and to stay on the track. Well, it's some results then, awareness, um, the networking that you mentioned, solidarity in a way, and that basically coming back to what you said, uh, Nanjala, in the beginning, that um, the, the threat is transnational, so also the reaction has to be transnational, there has to be cooperation across borders. Um, looking at the time, I'm afraid we have to already wrap up, but I would like to uh, give the panelists here in um, uh, Montevideo, I almost said, in Punta del Este, uh, the chance to uh, just give us maybe one more idea each about what can be done uh, to, yeah, to counter this threat. Angela, would you like to start? No, no, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do, I guess I would just double down on the, on the point about transnationalism cutting in both directions. And I think it's also very important in that matrix for us to be aware of what's happening in other parts of the world. For me personally, working on this set of reports, that really was one of the most enlightening experiences, being able to find those rhythms, those echoes that are happening across different social and political contexts in order to understand and appreciate the transformation in your own political context. You know, learning from Laish about what's happening in, in Brazil and thinking about, well, actually we had a massive SIM card registration exercise in Kenya that people had to protest because it was tied to trying to collect biometric information um, over and above what the law requires. And there's narratives that are emerging um, that unite different contexts that I think it's important for us as people who are operating in this space to be aware of. Uh, borders are social and political construct. The ideas that fuel state practices operate across these social and political constructs as government leaders respond or react to or behave alongside um, very specific motivations, including control, including dominance, including exclusion, including all of these things. So to think about the internet and, and digital freedom as a global narrative and not necessarily constrain ourselves to artificial borders. And I would just, again, finish by the point that we make is the point that um, Vladimir makes, and I think a lot of people who have been working on this space for a long time would say, digital rights are human rights. It's we can no longer continue to think about them as specialist conversations that are happening in niche corners. All of us need to be, the same way we think about the right to life, right to health, all of these things, start to think about our digital rights as part of that matrix. Vladimir, maybe next, and uh, I give Lies the last word. Uh, definitely, and I agree also with, with, uh, with Annie, uh, networking, uh, what we have been doing in, in Mexico, it has not been just like Article 19. It has been challenging with the support uh, with uh, other organizations, with uh, creating these uh, networks with uh, R3Z, with Social Tip, with many other uh, organizations. Litigation has also been an important part of, uh, of, of defying and believing that, that still the judiciary power has uh, something to do. And I will just like uh, reflect on, on two other things. I 
believe that also journalism, investigative journalists can be an ally. I think they can, they, they, they start revealing an important information on how like technologies are impacting uh, in terms of uh, human rights. Uh, research also for sure, it's uh, also another way. But I think there is like a strong uh, uh, connection of with, within civil society and, 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 and investigative journalism because it's not just like Pegasus, it's not just about spyware. We're seeing this increasing of digital technologies and I, I strongly believe in that. And lastly, identifying those uh, digital authoritarianism practices, even in, in, in democratic uh, societies, and uh, with, uh, with that in mind, uh, defying and, and challenging those type of, of things and pointing, pointing it out and really believing that, yes, we have to protect uh, the exercise of freedom of expression and other digital rights, also in the digital realm. Thank you. Nice. Okay, so I, I can retweet uh, Nanjala <laughs> and Vladimir. No, but I would say the same about transnational, transnationality. And I think working uh, on Advox was very enlightening because, wow, it's happening everywhere. And even very far away, there are very similar trends. So for Brazil particularly, I would like us to look into our neighbors in the region, uh, try to collaborate more. Look, what is happening literally across our borders that can give us insights as to what might happen here, as to how we might respond here. And I think as um, a practicing journalist, again, I think it's very important that all journalists take on the mission of covering digital authoritarianism. It's not something tech journalists will cover. It's also not something political journalists will cover. It's right there at the intersection. So I think uh, collaborating again and informing ourselves better of how these things happen and how to respond to these things uh, will bring the best coverage. And we need to inform our audiences and citizens because digital rights are human rights again. So I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for for now. But um, we have... Um come to the conclusion that we all agree on, on the way forward. Now we only have to do it. Thank you very much to the panelists here on the podium, also to Annie in Thailand. Thank you to all here in the room and uh, at the uh, computers and laptops uh, all around the world watching us here. From us, that's it. Thank you very much and uh, keep up the good fight. Bye-bye. <laughs>